So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, small details of big impact and the general topic area here is uh, takes a lot of little details to get a product to work well um, and it's actually pretty hard to ever give a talk on any of those details because on their own the details are pretty boring. Um, so we decided to put together a talk that had a few of them as vignettes that talk about uh, hopefully both motivate you to think about this kind of stuff in your own um, applications but also give you a sense of like what kind of stuff we think about uh, working on our product. Um, so first of all, I am Ycats, and I work on a lot of open source projects. Um, I don't actually know what to say about this slide, except I work on way too many open source projects, um, and I like it a lot, and it's great. Uh, and you probably know me from some of them. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, my name is Liz. I'm Infinite Math on the Twitter. Um, I used to be a cartoonist. I was a cartoonist for about 10 years before I got into engineering. Um, I have something like five books published out there that are graphic novels. Uh, I just started getting into programming about a year and a half ago, um, and I just started working at Tilda on Skylight uh, about three months ago. So, death by a thousand cuts, or big things come in small packages. Every day, you make a choice. Sure, your app works. Uh, it does its job. Your users are technically getting what they paid for, but you can do better. We can all do better. But how? User experience is a story, like a movie. You know exactly how you want it to go from beginning to end. User signs up. User logs in. User interacts with your landing page, etc. cetera. Uh, unintentional nod to Kansas, by the way. I didn't even think we were gonna be in Kansas City. <laughs> Um, but what if they click on something unexpected? What if they take a wrong turn? They can easily end up in a choose your own adventure style scenario that you never planned for and suddenly they're on the Vampire Express to Terror Island. Weird things happen. Users end up in unexpected places. <laughs> it's your job to make sure they're guided through seamlessly and they don't even realize it was a weird place to begin with. You don't want your user experience to end up being like that scene from Dune where Patrick Stewart is carrying a pug into a laser battle for some reason. <laughs> you don't want that. You want to be like Gandalf, riding in on a bunch of eagles to save Frodo and Sam at the peak of Mount Doom. Sure, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it too hard, but when you're in the middle of it and you're watching it, you're thinking, yeah, of course this is what happens. This is a good user experience. So, uh, the first thing I want, to, so we're going to talk about four um, different vignettes and the first thing I wanted to talk about was what seems like a very small problem. Um, but before I do that I want to just take a second to talk about Skylight for, uh, just so you have a context of what it is I'm talking about. This is Skylight uh, a while ago, a few months ago. Um, and you log in, it, you get a list of your endpoints, they're sorted by a thing we call agony, which basically just means thing, w things we think are probably a good idea for you to work on. So if uh, you have an endpoint that doesn't get hit a lot, then we don't care that much that it's slow. But if you have an endpoint that gets hit a lot, maybe a little bit slow matters a lot. So we try to combine those in a way that feels intuitive. Uh, we call that agony. Um, and then we also have these little heads up things, those little red icons that mean uh, there's some database problem or some memory problem and we try to give you some details about that. So that's sort of the experience. Um, you should definitely come by our booth to see a whole demo. but uh, you, what you can see on this page is that there's a bunch of numbers. Uh, and actually the agony uh, index used to just, it used to be invisible, it used to just be the way the default list was sorted. But that actually sucked and people couldn't, uh, we would say it was agony and they would get it and it would be great, but it meant that there wasn't a thing you could click on to sort by it, you had to, we had other UI was annoying. Uh, but there's this thing in the, the second to right column, it says RPM, um, it looks like this column here. and uh, it's like the thing you would do if you were designing this page, I think, the first time. And basically what happened is we shipped this feature like really early, it was one of the first things we did, and people kept saying to us like, there are too many things that say like 0.01 and I don't actually care about 0.01 or 0.03, those seem like the same thing. And like, 
what is an RPM? Like, uh, so New Relic has RPM and they tell you it means request per minute and that's what it means and you can learn that fast. But it is also true that the first time you ever see RPM in your life, it's like, what does that mean? Is it like a car term? Are they doing something with, so it, there's this problem. So the, the first thing that we do is, okay, if people don't care about the difference between 0 0.01 and 0 0.03, fine, we'll just say everything is less than one and we ship that. But that didn't help a lot because now there's just a lot of <laughs> less than ones. Uh, so this is something, um, if you've used Skylight, you know that this is a thing that we've worked on for a long time. All, all of our UIs are things that we've worked on for a long time, but this is one that took us a lot of time to figure out what the right answer is, and that's what I want to talk about. So what, what should we do? What's the solution? So we have a really great designer, so we tossed the problem over to him. We said, okay, what's, what should we do to make this easier? And he said, well, first of all, you're, indeed, RPM is not good. You should not say RPM. Uh, let's change that to popularity. And that is great, that's good. Um, and then he, without looking at any of the actual numbers, he just said, okay, we, we'll use a filled bar to indicate how popular your endpoint is. So like endpoints that are not very popular will uh, have an empty bar and endpoints that are very popular will have a filled bar. And I, we looked at this design, we said, ah, that's pretty good, that feels great. So obviously we should go ship it. And so, so we did. Um, the way Skylight works is we don't ship anything to every customer right away. We always uh, create a feature flag and because Skylight uses Skylight, we can test it on our own app. So we tested on our own app with the feature flag and we saw this. We said, okay, that was a cool idea and the word popularity is indeed good, but that isn't what we wanted. So what exactly is going on here? Why did that happen? Um, so first of all, this is like the thing you learned in school, that there's this uh, normal distribution, things are bell curves, uh, thing, most of the things are clustered off towards the center, uh, things that are not at the center decay at either side at the same rate, so uh, like a five foot tall person, uh, or sorry, like a ten foot tall person is just as uncommon as a zero foot tall person and a, a seven foot tall person is just as uncommon as like a three and a half foot tall person, whatever the exact details are here. They use the metric system here, which I, as an American, do not know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, point, <laughs> the point is that uh, this is how we think about the world and, and largely because physical things sort of operate this way, uh, things that are physical sizes, um, things that are just sort of random in nature have a sort of random result. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of things in the world actually look like this other distribution, the thing that's called log normal distribution and it's not surprising that if I show you this, probably like half the room has already left, they're just being polite and waiting for me to get to the next slide. Um, but this distribution doesn't look like a thing you learned in school and you probably already have enough trouble, I do certainly, with the thing you learned in school. So like forming an intuition about what's going on here is pretty hard. Um, but interestingly, this kind of thing actually shows up everywhere. So uh, the top left is income distribution. Uh, the top right is the amount survival of egg to smolting ratio. Uh, bottom left is uh, population size in a city. Bottom right is commute distance from your house. You can see, wow, these things all look the same. That perhaps is surprising. And if you go look at your skylight uh, endpoint, you'll see, wow, that actually looks also exactly the same. And in fact, it is so common, this is so much the case. So this distribution is called, the other one was called the normal distribution or bell curve. This thing is called the log normal distribution. And it's so much the case that this is common that there was a performance company that got bought by Sosta whose name was literally log normal, right? So the intuition that everyone has about bell curves is so wrong that this company called themselves log normal just to like make that point. So what's going on here? <laughs> What's going on here? What's going on here is that you expect, and our designer expected, that we we're talking about a bell curve, but we're actually not, right? So you thought, oh, well, you know, if we just put the amount of uh, popularity on the graph, then you'll have a bunch of things towards the middle, and you'll have some big ones and some little ones, but that's not actually what's happening. So uh, just like anything else, that's not what's happening, so this doesn't end up working out. So the first time somebody encounters this, I think people learn this problem, they say, oh, well, there's an obvious solution to that problem. My PhD friend in statistics has told me the solution, which is that you should just take the numbers and you rescale them in terms of a, uh, so I said it's log normal, so you use a log scale and you can rescale them and that, that works great. Now you, you have uh, popularity in terms of a log scale. But there's a bit of a problem here, which is that this person is going to think reasonably. If something is, if the bar is twice as big, that probably means there's twice as much popularity. And the reason that they think this is not an accident, it's not something that they have gone to school to learn, um, it's a thing called pre-attentive visual processing. 
Um, Pre-attentive visual processing is how most people uh, process most things the first time they see it. And here is a couple of examples. So um, the, the name of the game here is one of these things is not like the other. And if you look at the, uh, left, uh, the left image here, what you'll see is that there, it's very easy to notice that the red circle is red, and that's because there's a very strong visual, visual variable, and there are certain visual variables that are very powerful, that human beings um, understand in, in, instinctively. Uh, the right side has, also you can eventually discover that the circle is there without engaging the logical part of your brain, but it's a weak visual variable, it's harder to see. Um, similar story here, um, it, one of these things is not like the other. On the left side, it's quite easy. You, there's one variable, it's, is this thing filled? Is it empty? That's a pre-attentive variable, we get it right away. Um, on the right, there's just no distinct features, so it's actually hard to understand what it is that you're looking at. Um, so again, this, uh, our friendly emoji user says, double the ink means the, twice, the po twice as popular, obviously. And he thinks that because physical size, length, of things is a pre-attentive uh, variable, and you're, you're just not gonna fight that. There's no point in fighting that, so don't even try to, to switch to logarithmic uh, scale, even though your PhD friend who turns on the logical part of their brain may be able to fight the pre-attentive system in their PhD work. Uh, the human beings normally do not, and you, nobody signs up for Skylight to get a lesson in statistics, so this just doesn't work. Um, so what did we end up actually doing here? Um, we ended up going with this triangle thingamabob, and we didn't invent the triangle thingamabob. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, systems that have similar problems do it. Um, and interestingly, a thing that you'll notice is the uh, antenna meter is also a weirdly shaped thing. And if you actually, if you try to ask OS X, like I am a power user and I know the magical incantation where I can hold down Alt and click on the thing, they still give you a number that like no human can pre-attentively process incorrectly. You like have to Google what that means. There's no way that you could get, you could try to figure out what that actually means. And in fact, the whole reason why decibels exist in the first place is because noise is one of these weird distributions. And if you try to tell people, oh, think about noise in terms of how many joules it is or something like that, that equivalently doesn't work. So th these problems are all pretty similar and the canonical solution to this problem is the, is the uh, weirdly shaped uh, shapes. Uh, and the reason for that is that People don't, don't have a good job, uh, don't do a good job of identifying how much area weirdly shaped things have, so um, the pre-attentive system simply doesn't kick in. It's, it, by the time you start thinking about it, it's already too late, the pre-attentive system has no idea what's going on, and now you can make it mean whatever it is that you want. Um, so yeah, people don't know what's up. So we went with, um, we went with this, and uh, the, cool, the cool thing about this is that in addition to the pre-attentive system not kicking in and doing the wrong thing here, people are used to this antenna meter, meaning like, uh, if it's twice as big, it means like twice as signally, which doesn't mean anything. So popularity, similarly, actually turned out to be a good word. It means like twice as popular, but that doesn't really mean a lot. And so we, the, using this, the, um, this icon that has a general purpose meaning as doesn't mean a lot, hand wave, hard to say, um, turned out to be the right thing. Being that Skylight is a Rails profiler with a customer base of mainly developers, uh, we wanted to give our users the option of signing in with GitHub. This would add convenience for our customers who are probably already signed into GitHub anyway, but it would also position us to take advantage of the existing concept of GitHub organizations and their related permissions instead of having to come up with something similar on our own later on. Most people are familiar with the experience of signing into an app um, using authentication from some other application like Facebook, Google, whatever. Uh, you just click sign in with GitHub. Uh, you, it leads you to an interstitial page where you authorize the application and boom, you're signed in and returned to the app. Fortunately, most users will enjoy a seamless experience. Everything will work as it should and all will be right with the world. That said, we still wanted to account for the rare, not so happy path. Well, first of all, what is the happy path? Well, the least ambiguous way for a customer to connect their existing Skylight account to GitHub is to first sign in with their email and password, then head over to the account settings page um, and just click the connect to GitHub button. The customer will then see the connected account information, their GitHub username, uh, and then they can easily sign in with GitHub going forward. A common issue that we noticed uh, when we were looking at other apps uh, that use OAuth sign-in is that it's really easy for a user to not actually remember if they signed up with an email password combo uh, or OAuth or both. Uh, speaking for myself, I usually forget as soon as I sign in. Uh, <laughs> by displaying the information right there on the account settings page, uh, we're sort of aiming to mitigate that confusion. 
if for some reason the GitHub account you authenticate with is already connected to a different Skylet account, we'll just let you know in like a message bar at the top of the screen. So how about the edge cases? What about people who already have a Skylight account but it's not connected to GitHub yet and they click the sign in with GitHub button? In this case, we redirect the customer to an interstitial page with an email form uh, field pre-populated with their email address that we get from GitHub. Uh, we focus in on the password field to prompt you to sign in. Uh, once they're signed in, we just connect the account to GitHub automatically so they can just go forth and sign in with GitHub to their heart's content. Uh, but what about people who already have a Skylight account and they click sign up with GitHub? Obviously, we don't want to sign them up for a new account or treat them like they're new here. Uh, so even though they've, signed, uh, they've clicked sign up instead of sign in, we treat them as if they're signing in. We just log them right in. But since they did click sign up after all, we should just check to make sure that they're the right person. After all, it's totally possible that they really do mean to sign up, but their coworker signed into GitHub on their computer and we're logging them in as their coworker. So in this case, uh, we just kind of casually make them aware of who they're signed in as at the top of the screen uh, with this helpful welcome message. If they're not that user, they can just sign out and sign back in with their own uh, GitHub account. So if the customer already has a Skylight account, but it's not yet connected to GitHub, and they've used the same email for both, uh, clicking sign up with GitHub will lead to the same interstitial page, but with a little error message at the top that just says, you know, that email's already taken. Uh, again, all they need to do is sign out of the GitHub, sign in with their own account, and it'll be fine. So this meant that we had to implement OAuth. OAuth is easy, right? Sure. Let's say sure. There's even a super simple gem called OmniAuth GitHub we can use. However, there's a problem. There's always a problem, right? GitHub's OAuth configuration allows us to supply one redirect URL. This is how GitHub knows where to send a user once they're authenticated. It doesn't know the difference between a user who's signing up versus signing in versus connecting their existing Skylight account, so suddenly it's not so simple. We had to figure out how to deal with all the different roads a user might go down and account for how the user themselves might expect it to go. Uh, as you can see from this chart that I made, uh, that I drew myself. <laughs> so interstitials are terrible. I think we can all agree on that, right? Just think about all the times that you try to visit a website on your phone and you're forced to click through some nonsense interstitial that's trying to get you to download their app. You don't want to include these things unless you absolutely have to. An interstitial page can easily be that Patrick Stewart in a laser battle holding a pug thing that we're trying to avoid here. So how can we be Gandalf? How can we make this sort of incongruous thing feel as natural as possible? We thought long and hard about it before making the decision to include these interstitial pages, and we only included them once we realized that we were making a choice between a potentially awful experience for a small amount of users or a slightly awkward one for maybe a lot of users. Um, but we don't want people who mean to sign up for a new account to be let off to someone else's account with no explanation, right? We certainly don't want people accidentally cre creating duplicate accounts all over the place. We don't want to assume that the person who's logged into GitHub is the same person trying to create a new account, especially when we can just check and let them know. Um, at the same time, we don't want to replicate the typical terrible interstitial experience. So we spent a lot of time thinking about this. Anything we can do to create less work for the user is what we should do. If GitHub is passing us an email address and what we want is for the user to sign in to their existing account, just put it in the email field. If we want them to enter their password, focus on the password field. Just make it easy for your users. Be Gandalf. So let's talk about Rust. Uh, so we use Rust at Skylight and it's probably easy because a lot of people do this to think, oh, they probably use Rust because it was like a cool technology and they wanted to have an excuse to use it. Um, but actually, uh, when we started using Rust, it was not that cool of a technology and um, it was pretty scary. It was uh, still pretty new and we had a pretty good reason to use it. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve with the agent? So obviously in order for us to give you information about what's going on in your application, we need an agent that collects the information and sends it to some server that is processing it and producing those nice reports. So how does that, what is the, the problem here? Uh, the general problem for the agent is that we want to instrument your, uh, your application efficiently, but efficiently really is a pretty important thing here. If uh, you install an agent that is supposed to detect why your application is or slow and it makes your application slow, we probably have automatically failed uh, out, of the out of the gate. So it's pretty important. Everybody who builds these kinds of things cares a lot about making sure that 
the uh, agent, uh, the agent itself is not really impacting the performance of your application. So what, what possible solutions are there to, to uh, use? Uh, the most obvious solution, and this is what basically everyone does, including us out of the gate, is to write it in Ruby. Um, the nice thing about Ruby is that uh, Ruby is, an, is a safe language, and it's already a language that by definition you have in your app, because you're a Rails app, and uh, we can catch, we can be careful and catch exceptions, and uh, the likelihood of something going horribly, horribly awry is, is pretty low if we're careful. So write it in Ruby is one option, and it works pretty well to collect the baseline information, like how long it took to render a template. Um, unfortunately, Ruby itself is a pretty slow language, and that doesn't mean it's intrinsically slow uh, for everything, but if we're trying to collect a lot of very fine-grained information, it may end up being slow. And in particular, uh, a thing that we really wanted to do that we do now is collect information about how many allocations happened in a particular area of your application, and those are fine-grained areas, and that really means we need to hook into every single allocation. And Ruby has a nice, friendly C API for hooking into every allocation, um, but so should we write it in C? Should we write the part of it that hooks into every allocation in C? And unfortunately, the thing about writing things in C is that we're asking you to take our program and put it into your application, and if we just have to write anything that is performance critical in C, there's a pretty good chance that we mess up somewhere and take down your application. So um, I think we were pretty nervous. We have some C now, but we were pretty nervous about like just saying, oh, from now on everything is written in C. I think every, even the best C programmers, uh, like the C programmers that write crypto libraries occasionally mess up and have massive vulnerabilities like Heartbleed, right? So it's hard to get things right in C. Um, another option would be write it in C++, but actually C++ isn't that much better from the perspective of like, am I really sure I haven't messed up and caused the application to crash? So uh, we had an, a prototype in C++ that I think probably uh, we might have shipped, um, and it was it worked. Uh, but I, I was personally pretty nervous about like how many people on our development team would be able to maintain this thing. So. The thing about C and C++ is that it's actually pretty easy to write a program in C or C++ that compiles, runs, you run your tests, everything's great, and then, boom, you uh, have a segmentation fault and now a lot of your users are angry. So, uh, if it's your own segmentation fault in your own app, you're probably angry at yourself, but if we tell you to please install our agent and all of a sudden your entire Rails app starts crashing, uh, you will probably be very upset at us. And slow is better than angry users. So, uh, and in this case, slow doesn't mean the agent was slow, it just meant we couldn't add features like the allocation tracing stuff that we really wanted, right? So, so slow is better than angry user, but unfortunately slow means we can't ship the features that we, that we want. So what sort of happened around the same time that we were exploring the C++ uh, story is uh, Patrick Walton from the Rust team wrote a blog post that said, like, by the way, we previously thought that a garbage collector was a pretty important thing for Rust, but what we recently realized is that the ownership system that Rust came up with is actually uh, generally better than, than the garbage collection story for systems programming, for C programming, and um, we're gonna get rid of the garbage collector. He said this in like August or September or something like that, and I happened to come across that blog post and like in October, I said, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna see if I can take apart the hot spots of our application, uh, specifically the serialization parts, the parts serializing the trace and sending to the server, I'm gonna see if I can turn that into Rust, and I, I took like a couple weeks and did it. Um, and so we ended up going with Rust. I ended up being able to pr uh, ship a pretty uh, a productive uh, little slice of our application. We didn't rewrite the whole agent, and we never will. The, a big chunk of our agent really does want to be um, something that hooks into Ruby at the Ruby layer. Um, but we, we basically, we got to a point where it was clear that we could take hot spots of our application, rewrite it in Rust, compile it, ship it, to, uh, ship it as part of our gem, and be very confident that it wouldn't crash. And in all the years that we've now been shipping Rust, we've never ex had a crash uh, seg fault in the agent that was attributable to our code at all. So that's actually pretty great, um, and that's something that maybe you might find surprising, and it, it is actually just a fundamental characteristic of Rust that um, unless there's a bug in the Rust compiler, and a bug in the Rust compiler is basically like a, a bug in Ruby, like a bug in Ruby could mean that your Ruby program seg faults, but that's not your fault. Um, and if, some, if you install a C extension in Ruby and there's a bug in it and it causes a seg fault, that's also not your fault, that's the C extension's fault. Um, and the similar story in Rust. If you write, uh, if you write Rust code and it compiles, um, it has the same story, it's a safe language, just like Ruby. Um, and so the, the idea is if it compiles, it can crash, and I would definitely recommend that you take a look. This is the Rust 1.0 blog post, and so we talked about um, 
in the blog post, we talked about uh, stability in general, about uh, Rust being a stable language. We talked about community, which is a pretty important thing for Rust. But we also talked about these four things, uh, memory safety without garbage collection, concurrency without data erases, abstraction without overhead, all of which sound like uh, contradictions in terms and which through very uh, s simple primitives that work pretty well, um, Rust ended up being able to allow you to say if it compiles, it won't crash. Um, and really what it comes down to is um, in Rust, you can write low-level code that you know is efficient without fearing that you'll crash. And probably for your own application, 2013 was not the right year to do it. But for us, um, writing fast code that also we were sure couldn't crash was like a core business value that we needed to figure out how to do. So, you know, rolling up our sleeves and getting into the swamp with whatever Rust looked like back then uh, was well worth it. Um, and it, in fact, allowed us to ship the allocations uh, the allocation trace feature and make our, our, our agent small uh, at a time where perhaps people didn't realize that that was possible. Uh, tomorrow, Godfrey is giving a talk, uh, Chan Can Code, on Helix, which is our, uh, we're open sourcing a binding layer uh, between Rust and Ruby. It's pretty cool. Uh, he's going to talk about it, and you should definitely go check it out. All right, names. Let's talk about names. Names are really important. Just ask anyone with a name more complicated than Jane Doe. Getting someone's name right is a sign of respect. When someone introduces themselves to you for the first time, most people will at least try to make sure they're pronouncing it properly. And if you're the one introducing yourself, you can pretty well guess that someone who doesn't put in that effort probably is not worth your time. But let's go a little deeper. People change their names or they go by names that aren't the same name on their government issued ID. Uh, but they still need billing and other official documents to be addressed to their legal name. People change their names for all kinds of reasons. Uh, sometimes they're fairly innocuous ones, but sometimes they're more serious. Um, there are situations in which calling someone by their legal name instead of their chosen one can present an actual safety risk for them. But keeping that in mind, respecting your customers alone should be enough of a reason to put some effort into calling them the name they want to be called. I've been called Liz my entire life, so the minute I pick up the phone and someone on the other end says, oh, is Elizabeth there? I know it's a sales call. I hang up on them. <laughs> a lot of services will take your full name and nothing else, and then every few weeks you get an email that awkwardly addresses you with like, greetings, Elizabeth Bailey. <laughs> I literally received this one while I was putting this talk together. <laughs> so, of course these services mean well, but it's awkward. <laughs> it's the Patrick Stewart holding a plug thing again. It takes you out of the experience. Not only does it take you out of the experience, but it also makes your service seem really disconnected and robotic. No one wants to read an email sent by a faceless corporation. Most people will delete that email without even reading it. If your team is anything like ours, you're hardly a faceless corporation. You're a bunch of people who really care a lot about your product and its customers. So how do we avoid this problem? How do we handle names? When customers sign up for Skylight, we used to ask them for their first and last names and nothing else and then we would address our emails to their first name. This works well enough in most cases, but again, what about the edge cases? Well, as it turns out, they're not even really edge cases. More than half of our own company actually goes by a name that's not on their driver's license. So it's not that uncommon for someone to go by something other than their legal name, so it really makes sense to design for this. Case in point, we have a large number of customers signed up for our Skylight emails, which are sort of quick little messages we like to send out once or twice a week, giving updates on our progress on various features, uh, what conferences we'll be at, things like that. We don't want to alienate our customers right away by calling them the wrong name. They might delete the email before they even get to the sweet dog gif. In our case, we opted to swap out the first and last name with full name and nickname. So pretty much all correspondence now is addressed to the user's nickname, but we still have their full name on file for billing purposes and other official business if we need it. For our existing customers, we just concatenated their existing first and last names for their full name, and we used their existing first name as their nickname. But we wanted to make sure that we kept track of who chose and confirmed their own nickname and who was just assigned their existing first name as a nickname. We did that by adding a simple Boolean field called nickname confirmed and just marking it false for all our existing users. Whoa. Uh, yeah, this is all well and good, but this, it's how we handled the UI uh, that at the, bleh. <laughs> this is all well and good, but it's how we handled the UI for this problem that really gets to the heart of this. When a user signs up for Skylight with their email address, we start by trying to guess what they might want to be called based on what they enter as their full name. And warning, there are actually some like 10 year old Doctor Who spoilers in the following GIFs. So we don't just assume 
that this is the case and we move forward. We ask the user, can we call you that? If they say yes, we mark their nickname as confirmed and we just call them that name from there on out. But we don't, uh, yeah. If not, all they have to do is click no and they're, pr they're prompted to enter whatever name they'd prefer to be called. So once they're signed up, we mark their nickname as confirmed as well. But, <laughs> I warned you. Um, what about people who don't want to enter a nickname or they just don't for some reason, they just don't enter it uh, when they sign up? We'll continue to use whatever we think is their first name and we'll keep their nickname marked as unconfirmed. So what do those people do if they decide that they do want to change their nickname from what we guessed for them? Well, all they have to do is go to the settings page and where it says, can we call you that, just click no. If the user hasn't told us yet that it's okay to call them Jack, uh, we just make sure to ask rather than assuming. They'll get the same opportunity to enter their preferred name and save it and now it's marked as confirmed so we know not to ask again. So let's say you've saved and confirmed your nickname. We'll assume this is okay. Uh, you can notice the subtle difference in wording, we'll call you versus can we call you. Um, but let's say you need to change it to something else. It's easy. You just go back to the settings page and right where it says we'll call you that, you click change. Then you can just go ahead, enter your new nickname and save it, done. If they haven't set up their app yet and they get this screen when they sign up, we have roughly the same interface set up here. We greet them by the name we have in our database, but if they haven't confirmed yet, we ask, you know, can we call you that? And they can either accept it, uh, whoa, why does that keep happening? I don't know where I am. Uh, anyway, yes, so we're here. Um, yeah, so we call them by what we have in our database, but if they haven't confirmed it yet, we ask, can we call you that? And they can either accept it and change it right there, or you know, they can do it on the settings page later on. Uh, this is also, if people sign up for GitHub, uh, sign up with GitHub, they get directed to this first. They never get a chance to enter their nickname. So this is actually a great catch-all sort of for people who sign up with GitHub as well. Uh, so for the technical implementation, we had some interesting challenges. Some of the app's interface is uh, in Rails views, while most of it is in Ember. Uh, the sign-up page is a Rails view, so we tackled that first. When I first learned to program, I learned Ruby and Rails first. Uh, I only knew a tiny bit of JavaScript when I started learning Ember. And then I found myself working on a number of Ember applications that just used a Rails API, so I was almost never in a situation where I need to write straight up JavaScript for a Rails view. Uh, when we were initially working on this, I worked on it largely with my pairing partner, Rocky, and we had both just started working at Tilda, I think, that week. Um, so we were both new to working on Skylight. Rocky was new to Rails, I was new to straight up JavaScript, um, and we, you know, we found that our, you know, weaknesses and strengths sort of complemented each other. Um, so yeah, since I had never built an app in plain JavaScript with jQuery before, like Rocky had, I had no idea how much easier Ember actually made things. We needed to use debounce in order to give our users a little breathing room while they were typing out their names, so we would be sure we wouldn't display anything until the user's done typing. So without debounce, the experience would be a lot choppier. They'd see every single character on the screen as they typed it, which is like super not graceful, not elegant at all. Uh, it's certainly not something we want. So, something so seemingly simple, um, it's actually, I found, not native to JavaScript. Uh, it turned out we actually had to write our own jQuery debounce plugin after scouring the internet for a solution. We ended up basing our plugin on a blog post by Dave Walsh that worked really well for us. Uh, something else I was unaware of is that some methods uh, like trim are not accessible in all browsers. So we had to polyfill JavaScript string.trim method in case we have a user who's on one of those browsers. Uh, <laughs> This method is important because we wanna make sure uh, we're removing that white space surrounding whatever name the user enters so we can be sure it displays properly. A lot of apps don't do this right or at all, uh, which is really frustrating as a user. I can't even count the number of times I've tried to log into an app and I was told, oh, your email's not valid, your email's wrong. I know this is the right email. Oh, it's a white space at the end of it. It's so annoying. Um, so, yeah, overall, when it came down to I think this is not gonna let me do this. No, no. Oh, no. god damn it. You can, you can it, it type keeps, D. Oh, okay, it keeps, it keeps going forward. Pro tip, you can type <laughs> U and D to move your speaker notes up and down, you know. It worked when I practiced I don't know it. Why U and D. <laughs> this did not happen to me when I practiced it. Overall, when it came down to names, we really put a lot of thought into making sure our users were being addressed by the name that made them feel comfortable. And we tried to find every opportunity to make sure we're getting it right so they can change it as soon as possible. So, uh, in closing, uh, when you're building an application, the little things really matter. Um, this is something that 
Uh, this is something that you can lose in the technical work. It can, you can spend a lot of time on like what JavaScript library to use for this or that thing, or what OAuth library, what uh, you know, how to this, you are going to structure your migrations. But at the end of the day, you're building a product for users. And um, like Liz said in the beginning, when you're building an app, it's kind of like a movie. You're building an experience for users. That's how you should think about it. Um, you really want your users to have a, a really good experience. And like a movie. Uh, Making an amazing, like, like in the same way that making an amazing movie requires uh, fanatical dedication to every detail, I, I am often inspired by the fact that if you look at uh, stories about Pixar movies, Pixar uh, animators will say like, I spent 30 days on this 30 frames that only lasted like one second, but we really wanted to spend every little second to make it right. And I think there's a really big difference between uh, the end product of applications that, t that take the time to get these little details right, or movies that take the time to make sure that the expression on his face is exactly right at this moment for 30 frames or 40 frames, um, and the opposite, right? You, you can make the decision to not care. It's, it's easy to say, ah, that whole name thing that we just discussed doesn't matter, or that whole awe thing, like, why does it even matter? We'll just do, it's, it's fine, there's one redirect URL, we'll just use that to mean there's just one flow. But in fact, uh, the user is experiencing something, they're experiencing, they're experiencing an experience that you have put together for them, and it, it's worth taking the time to think about what they're experiencing at every step. It's worth taking the time to say, uh, if the user presses sign up with GitHub, there is a difference between whether the account exists with this email or not. Uh, the experience that a person should have is different. Or like Liz said before, the subtle difference between can we call you Jack or will call you Jack, depending on whether you actually took a step to confirm your email. It's very easy to say, uh, Eh, it doesn't, who cares? But I think as a user, you know that there's a big difference between applications that always say yes to that kind of thing and applications that always say no. Applications that always say no just always suck. Um, and it's very, it's hard to say, oh, we'll say no, we'll say yes some of the time. I think you have to have an attention to detail and take the time to get the little details right. Um, so uh, Liz talked about this earlier and I wanted to reiterate. Um, this is just a taste of the kind of stuff that we, uh, we do at Tilda. We have a, a, let's say, twice weekly email, but that's a lie. Uh, a, a periodic email that we try to send out twice a week. Um, we used to say daily, but that really didn't happen. Um, we have a, an email that we send out where we talk about stuff like this. Uh, Basically, every engineer gets assigned uh, a day every couple of weeks, and they write uh, what they worked on, what things were hard, uh, what details they spent time on that day, and I think it's really pretty great, and you should sign up for it. Um, you can sign up for it. Uh, you have to make a Skylight account to sign up for it, but you can sign up for it with a free account, and you never have to pay, uh, pro tip. So uh, just make an account, um, and you can get access to the, to the daily email. To, we used to call it daily email. To the periodic development journal. Frequent emails. <laughs> Uh, like a lot of people sign up, by the way. It's like we have like, so I, when we started, I said I wasn't sure what would happen. Uh, like maybe like six people would sign up, but we have like, I don't know, hundreds, close to a thousand people who receive it every day or whenever we send it out, it turns out uh, now. And I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, I would also like, I think if you, have, if you have the ability to do something like this for your own company, the world is a better place when people talk about how they work. So uh, thank you. <laughs>